today we're talking about the afterlife artist Colin and his signature sound. And yes, I've included the project file and presets, so make sure you stick around for that. Here's the deal. Last Saturday, I was having a highly effective studio session, which consisted of me scrolling through Instagram. <laughs> when I came across this video of Colin playing at Coachella. I said, wait a second, I think I know this. Isn't this the Cranberry Juice song? I heard the remix and I immediately wanted to hear more. So I hop on Google and I can't find anything. And as of today, while I record this video, I still can't find anything about this remix. I'm gonna assume it's his, so here we go. This is the Fleetwood Mac Dreams Collins Coachella Cranberry Juice Remix Remake. Let's break this down. Here's the actual remake itself. There's seriously so many things in this that I want to show you. So let's break it down into four categories. The leads, the bass, the drums, and whether or not Moose's favorite potato chips are gluten-free. It doesn't say on the bag, so I don't know. Colin really does balance both sides of the melodic techno genre. Today, however, we're going to be looking at the more melodic side and what goes into making it. Okay, for the leads, let's first take notice of the simplicity. This immediately stood out to me. The simplicity in writing, the simplicity in sound design. What he's done though is created a bit of call and response between the first two bars and the second two bars. You can see they're very similar, but notice the second two bars, the melody climbs up. This helps create that back and forth so it almost feels like they're talking to each other, the two parts. It's simple, but enough to keep things moving along. This also plays really well with the bass line because as the melody is climbing up, the bass line is actually going down in the scale. It creates this extra bit of like emotion almost. And that's something you should take note of and definitely try. Having the melody and bass go in different directions, it works really well. Now, I also mentioned the simplicity in the sound design. As we look at the main lead in Serum, you're gonna notice it's a simple saw wave. I went with the basic mini, but any will do. As far as the ADSR and envelopes go, you'll see the values on screen here, but basically envelope one is going to be for the amp envelope. Envelope two is going to be modulating my filter cutoff. This leads me to the next thing that stood out, and that is the dynamics in the sound and performance. Notice when the filter is closed, envelope two creates this tighter pluck sound, and as I open the filter, it gets brighter and longer. He's using this trick to create more feeling in the sound and melody, because it's that movement and change of sound that really creates the emotion. Those shorter, darker notes transforming into the longer open notes. So how does he do it? Is it just filter automation? Maybe a bit of that, but there are also also some really dope tricks you could do with the filter cutoff to create more dynamics and interest in your leads. You'll notice I have the velocity routed to the filter cutoff. This means I can control my filter position with the velocity parameter inside the piano roll and those MIDI notes. To do this, drag and drop on the filter cutoff and adjust this little blue line. This is gonna be called the range. And it's exactly that, it's a range. How far do you want the filter to open at its maximum? That's what you're setting here. Now in the piano roll, if I adjust the velocity parameters on my MIDI notes, you'll see it'll change the sound and position of that filter. Now you could use this to create cool rhythms and grooves within your lead, or you could just use it to create those slow ups and downs of the filter opening and closing. You'll also see I've routed macro one to control envelope two's amount on the filter. As I automate this to open and close, you'll see the effect becomes more prominent. But yeah, all this stuff together, it's awesome. Makes a huge difference. Onto a couple other details in the synth. I do have this LFO mapped to the phase and the fine tune control in the oscillator. This is creating just a slight pitch wobble and variation. This is an awesome trick when you have these basic wave shapes. It makes them sound less cheesy, less robotic and video game-like. Let me push it further so you could actually see what it's doing.
As we flip to the backside with the effects, there's nothing special going on here. A tiny bit of saturation, compression, a small boost to the high end using a high shelf. But let's stick on this topic of effects because without them, this lead is nothing. It's really not that special. Check this out. make a huge difference on this sound. So the first thing you're gonna notice is I'm using the reverbs and delays on sends and returns instead of inside the synth. Couple reasons for that. If I leave them on in the synth, they're gonna run through my post-processing chain, the overdrive, the compression, and I don't want that. It's gonna get sloppy, it's gonna get muddy. I don't have control over it. The other disadvantage is as I turn up those dry wet knobs in the synth, I'm gonna lose my original synth sound. Yes, it gives me more of those effects as I turn the knob up, but the volume of my actual source the synth it's quieter and quieter you gain the effect at the expense of the dry signal sends and returns don't do that you could have your cake and eat it too as the synth sends more volume it returns more effect but the important part is you never lose that original synth it's adding the effect alongside of the synth rather than losing the synth to add the effect as far as the delay goes you'll also notice i have this bandpass eq really emphasizing the mid-range frequencies it's also side chained back to the lead itself. This ducks the delays from the original synth performance. You do this typically to prevent the delays from overlapping or phasing out the original sound itself. Now for the reverb, this effect is everything. It really sets the mood of the song. Notice it's a longer, lush sounding reverb. This is important to nail in your own music as well because it has to match the vibe. If this were a tight, shorter reverb, listen to the difference. It's not the same. wild how different that felt, right? Don't be afraid to try long and short in your own songs. Try it. See what sounds best. That's all that matters. Be less concerned with numbers on plugins and more about what it's doing to the sound. No one in the club is ever going to ask you how long your reverb decay is. It either sounds good or it sounds bad. You're going to notice though, there's a lot of EQ on this longer reverb. That's pretty common though when you have longer decay times, because think about it. The long tail is going to be overlapping a ton of shit in your mix. And the goal of reverb is to fill space, not to like mask and block out other important instruments. Now the difference between the first and second EQ is very important to understand. They are not the same thing. EQs that come before the reverb will actually help shape the reverb sound. You're basically picking which frequencies are allowed to run through the reverb. To give you a good example of this, let's look at my kick drum because yes, I do have reverb on my kick. What, you have reverb on a kick? But what about that random person on Reddit who's always screaming that you can't put reverb on low end instruments. Well, they're right, but I don't have low end going through my reverb because I cut it using an EQ before. If I only put the cut after the reverb, well, I'd be cutting a fat, muddy reverb with a ton of low end. I'm polishing a turd. Instead, I cut them before the reverb and now it sounds nice and clean. You'll also see I'm adding saturation to the reverb to make it a bit more colorful, more pronounced. I want it to be bigger, exaggerated. Sometimes you could even use compression or OTT to get a similar effect on reverbs. And finally, there is some sidechain ducking the reverb back to the original synth, just like we had done with the delay. I did try and use stock plugins for majority of this tutorial, but if you had Track Spacer or FabFilter Pro Q, TDR Nova, some sort of dynamic EQ, you could do that same sidechain effect using those. And it actually does sound a bit better. And if you're lost, we'll talk about that on another video. I do have two more lead layers, which you can go through on your own when you download the project and preset file. And I know I haven't given you the link yet that's coming up, but these two layers are basically there to fill out some width and higher frequencies. You'll notice they're significantly quieter than the main lead. And they're also different wave shapes. When layering, it's important to stack different sounds on top of each other not similar. So the main lead was saw waves, these are triangles. The main lead was narrow, these are wider. And within these two layers, one is low, one is high. You could see all these differences and that's what makes them work. As we move over to the bass group, you'll notice I have three layers. This main layer, the wide layer, and the pluck layer. 
Notice again how each one has a specific purpose and they stay clear of each other. The main layer is this fat, square, and saw wave combo. This is doing most of the work. And the wider layer is higher up, detuned saws, multiple voices of unison, giving it that spread sound. But more importantly, just a different tone and character from the main one. And finally, the pluck layer is just some little simple E bass guitar. This is providing a little more knock and transient. The drums on this one sounded like a classic drum machine, so I immediately went to the stock Ableton 707. It got me pretty close, but there was one sample in that kit I couldn't use, and that was the kick. It's just not fat enough for modern electronic music. So what I did was I took a kick from my own library and I fused it together with that 707 kick. This gave me the click and sound of the 707, but the bottom fat tail was of one of my modern kicks. How I went about it though is a little bit different and I recommend you try this. Instead of layering kicks by stacking them on top of each other, try taking the click of one kick and placing it at the start of another kick sample on the same track. Then all you have to do is crossfade those two samples together. I'm gonna give you an example of this so you could hear it in real time. The next thing I want to talk about is Colin's use of variation in his drums. I'm always impressed by his drum work because it's super simple and clean, but he throws in just enough variation to keep things fresh and fun for the duration of a song. And he creates these variations with all his elements. It could be removing kicks or kick fills, kick stutters. It could be snare rolls or snare fills. The other thing he does that I love is he mimics a real person playing the hi-hats. So for example, he'll vary between open and closed hats as if someone was lifting their foot on the pedal of the hi-hat. And this creates some sick rhythmic variation. Next thing we're covering is drum velocity. Always mess with your drum velocities. Think of this in most cases as like the volume of each drum hit. We can use this change in velocity again to create different rhythms, grooves, patterns, feelings from our drums. Look at these hi-hats as an example. You'll notice some are less, some are more, and that gives it that up and down feel. You'll see I've done this in a subtle version too with the ride cymbals. Every other ride is just a little bit louder. So it gives this cool one, two, one, two, one, two kind of feel. Okay, let's pause for a second and let me give you the link so you could download this project and the presets. I'm going to pop that URL on screen right now. Keep in mind for these serum presets, they're going to include some reverb and delay. Now we know I didn't use it that way in the project, so it's not going to sound exactly the same, but for those people that can't open the project that don't have Ableton, I've included them in there so you can still have the presets with some effects, but you sends and returns in your own doll. It'll sound better. Now that we dissected the more melodic side, of Colin and Afterlife, it's time to turn the page to the heavy hitting sounds of Anima and Cassian. Tap the video on screen right now because I want to uncover three production secrets they're using in their City on Fire remix that's going to make a big difference in your own productions. And this is very different from what we just went over. So tap that video and meet me over there.